I started off as a uh, English literature teacher, uh, and um, there were no jobs. And someone was like, "Oh, why don't you take a special education course? Because there's a million jobs, uh, and a million, or a food uh, like a home ec course." So those were the two. And um, I had moved from Victoria to Vancouver, where I, you know, had zero contacts. And I booted up the kind of UBC education courses because it's it's quite involved. It's quite hard to become a teacher. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that was really difficult to go through that education. Uh, it's not intellectually challenging. It's just like a huge time demand, you know. And there was a special education course and I took it. And then like the next day I got hired. Uh, and so that put me into special education. Uh, and then I kind of worked my way through the systems and I've ended up as a resource teacher in an elementary school. So I'm essentially uh, someone who comes in and works with kids. The brunt of my job is working with kids with learning disabilities. Um, so, and what's interesting about a learning disability is such a stupid term because disability implies this like huge, gigantic thing that you'll never be able to. I guess physical disabilities, um, there's a wide spectrum of things that can cover. Yeah, I just think it's problematic, too. And parents hear it and they th they think that it's, you know, it's just this like tsunami wave that's just come out of nowhere and derailed their children's lives. And the thing, the, the only way you can get a learning disability actually is if you have average or above average intelligence. And so when I started working with kids with learning disabilities, I noticed they reminded me a lot of like my friends their sense of humor, their kind of their outlook. Uh, I think a lot of musicians actually, I, I mean, I don't know for sure because I'm not going to give my friends any fucking tests, <laughs> but there's a particular kind of um, on the edge intelligence that I'm like, huh. There are people that you meet and without diagnosing them, you're like, oh, you process the world differently than me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, basically my jam i guess because i met so many like really brilliant people in my circles as a musician who i know kind of struggle with the the you know the regimented uh filling out forms filling out grants uh is is but i know that they're brilliant successful people is to try and figure out with these kids like okay well, what do you love you know like and and because i think that the education education system can be really damaging for kids to go through um so that's kind of how they meet in my mind is just working with these kids and thinking someday you're going to grow up to be this awesome human being and you only have to be Really, you know, you only have to be awesome in the ways that you are awesome. You don't have to be awesome in every single facet of every single little thing that you do. Are they with you long enough that you feel like you can foster that to some degree? Yes and no. My austerity means I have less and less me to go around. You know, it's 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 I call it capacity. Other people call it bandwidth. You know, this idea of, of you have a schedule you have kids that you have to see. And every year there's more and more kids, which makes it more and more difficult to see and successfully connect with all your kids. That's an ongoing challenge, I think, with anyone who works in, you know, the public, uh, any kind of social service. I like capacity because to me that implies more than just time. It, you know, it implies the sort of emotional capacity that goes I know, into as well. I do, I do too. I think my colleagues are sick of me saying it. <laughs> of you just making you know? up terms. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, they're not sick of that. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So that's my job and it probably will stay my job. Now, I worked very hard in my life to only to not work full time. At first, when you're a teacher, you're just like, oh, my gosh, you asked me to do something. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll take it. Like most jobs, right? I mean, you, yeah. you, you want to like prove to the higher ups that you're good and, and should be kept around. Yeah, I think that's that used to be true. But I think maybe we're realizing, yeah, sure. You know, but I think you should just want to do that anyways, especially my job. Like my jobs work about working with the kids, you know, so like I think it's better to think. What is the point of my job? Is the point my po no one will answer to impress my boss? 
<laughs> right? The the higher to the point of my job is to impress the higher ups. In your interview, when they say, "What do you want to accomplish in this job?" and if you look at them and say, "To impress you." <laughs> You reach across a table and you you cradle yeah. her hand in yours. <laughs> right. Don't hand. break eye contact. <laughs> I wonder if you get the job or not. Yeah, it depends like, on the well, person well, and it depends yeah. on the job. I think well, maybe actually, a teaching yeah. job probably would not get that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, what I was going to say because it kind of connects to my musical practice uh, is I worked really hard to find a schedule. I only work three and a half days a week. And that's now I'm in my zone now, you know. Uh, and so for a couple of dark years, I worked five days a week and it was just abysmal for me, in part because I didn't have an, uh, enough time to put into music. And now I feel like I have enough time away from music that when it's when I have a day, you know, this is my Friday and I am so excited to play music because I haven't done it for a couple of days. Yeah. So uh, for me, it's it, I've, I'm in my sweet spot. You said musical practice. Is that a word like capacity? I mean, practice, I I don't know. For some reason, I think of meditation when I think of people talking yeah, about their practice. That's, I'm, glad that's that, I'm glad that you picked up on that, I guess, because someone the other day, I've been doing a lot of, 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 of these podcasts, um, and um, someone said career, and I was like, whoa, 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 man. <laughs> you back it up. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, you know, I just had to say, like, I know that you're just whatever you just use that term. And, and I understand why you might use that term, because you're talking about the longevity of my practice. But I mean, career, it, it turns into a career risk. And I really like it. That's not for me, uh, irregardless of the royalty statements, you know, <laughs> or lack of it's just you you have to hustle too hard. and uh, and. I don't know if I'm a very good at ethically hustling. Some people can do it. They can really walk that line between like, I got to get what's good for me, but somehow I'm able to spread it out and I'm not, you know, smothering a baby for that next gig. But I just felt like, you know, the, the few times in my life where I did try and make my living from music, like it gave me a pretty unhealthy feeling about myself and about my own relationship to music. So I kind of thought, you know, I don't, I don't think this is for me. And uh, if I was able to not have a, a kind of a financial relationship with music, or just as importantly, like, if it's your job, and you're doing it all the time, I feel I felt a bit polluted by it, you know. Uh, so when I say practice, what I mean by practice could just you could just sum it up as that's how I think of my body of work. But also I have a daily practice. Like I play, I wake up, I come down, I w make sure I wake up early. I play for a little bit, even on the days that I do work. And then the days that I don't work, I play for a little bit more. And so that just means that I'm, there isn't like, you know, there's no, there's no moment of inspiration where I reach for my canvas and, and want to like paint the glimmering snowscapes of Mount Baker it's an everyday thing. And so you're, you're always loose, you know, when you're doing it every day. And what's cool about it is it, you end up, you are, you always have songs. Yeah. I mean, the, the flip side though, I, I assume is that you also always have to be open to that inspiration. I mean, there are going to be those times when you're not around your guitar and something clicks. Never, never, <laughs> never, no. Not, not, there's never been just in this podcast and 500 odd episodes and, you know, and interview musicians before that. I don't recall anyone ever telling me that. I mean, it's always that conversation of sometimes I'm walking down the street or I'm washing the dishes and it trickles and in. A melody appears in their mind. A melody or words, you know, you sing into your phone or jostling down in notes. Yeah. Uh, I believe it. I'm sure, you know, just because it doesn't happen to me. For me, it's this daily thing. It's a kind of meditative practice. And I'm not really thinking about anything. And then all of a sudden, I'll look down and like, that's really cool. That's really cool. And occasionally, it's happened that, that I mean, I guess you could say that, uh, like, when you do this enough, there are days when I write a song in about four minutes. And so that would be the whole thing. 
Uh, but I think that comes from the daily thing of, of being loose. Uh, and it never, ever happens where I'm like on the bus and I'm like, oh, my God, driver. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm a musician. Pull over. <laughs> My muse, I see her on the horizon. Yeah, no, never. It's funny, and I know that the things that musicians write and or are are asked to write in the press release to describe their new album and single are often written in a certain way to to sort of fit in with that press release. But the the thing that strikes me about these moments when you describe your songs is there are these very fully for- formed stories you're almost describing it sounds like a lucid dream in some cases sometimes yeah uh the this past record i don't know if they're these are dream songs they're more recollection songs you're recalling like these very sort of specific moments or you know strange little things the kinds of things that i think most of us your landlord's cream cheese for example will forget in in daily life, but I, I, I just made it from the standpoint of you can describe them with a very vivid recollection. Yeah, I mean, remember, I'm not able actually to go back in time and verify. <laughs> there, there might be a little bit of embellishment. I've come to to I've come to terms with that that the way that we all remember things is might be slightly or more than slightly fictionalized. Uh, or embellished, or I don't know what the if there's a better word for it. Our brains certainly fill in the gap, but yeah. it's just the the way in which I'll hear or read someone describe a song they wrote, and a lot of times it's very abstract and it's very disjointed and it's little bits and pieces here and there, and it just sounds like there's a sense in which it kind of pours out of you. Yeah, I, there might be an organizational principle that that is somehow deeper, you know, why, why do these, why do we put these image clusters together? Why does, like, if you think of like an episodic, you know, retelling that reminds you of one thing to the next thing and that, oh yeah, that reminds me of another thing. There might be a, some really neat organizational intelligence that's, that is just at a deeper level. Or- certainly true. And, and certainly you, w- whether it's a specific song or an album, I have had a lot of conversations wherein the person who wrote it didn't realize what the common thread was or what those organizing principles were until either A, it was out of them, or B, some time had passed and they could revisit it. Yeah. I mean, or C, sometimes actually I find I don't mind talking to people about my work because actually secretly sometimes I'll walk away and be like, oh, I didn't even realize that I was doing that. But actually, you're that person who commented on that. It's actually very right. Yeah. 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 I know it seems like sheer unbridled narcissism, (laughs) which perhaps, you know, an element of it is. But uh, for me, actually, artistic growth comes from a conversation, which is why I actually feel quite sad about the demise of the record review. Okay, the demise of the record review. Well, what's left then? If all that's left is like the algorithm. That's insane, you know? Uh, I don't know how artists can grow. The algorithm doesn't point out the things that you're doing well and the things that you might be able to do slightly better. Sure, sometimes a record review is just like a garbulated press release, you know, and you're like, well, I think you could have done better. (laughs) But there are people who work at it in this, you know, in a very with a very critical approach. And uh, by critical, I don't mean mean, I just mean. I'm going to unpack this and analytical like, analytical. Yeah. And, and I think that's actually very helpful for people who make things. I used to write them all the time. I mean, you know, when I really started writing professionally or semi-professionally, there were like skyscraper and rock pile DIW. I was writing for all these places that were, mm-hmm. if not entirely reviews, at least mostly reviews. One of the things that I, I don't know if struggled with is the right word, but is the sort of the impulse to kind of over to put too much of myself into a review and put too much of my own sort of 
how I'm approaching the record. And it, and it's and it's hard to strike that balance because you do want to obviously get to some deeper truth. You do want to attempt to come to a piece of music on the artist's own terms. But obviously, if it's not getting through to you, then maybe it's not doing its job. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, but maybe there's enough music out there that will in some ways touch a nerve positively or negatively. I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons that we're not seeing as much interest in record reviews is that there was too much writing on things that you found middling. I ultimately, I mean, and this just this is coming from a place of somebody who's been in publishing for a long time. I, I think it's just a symptom of a larger issue of again, we're getting back to the C word in careers, but it's it's like very pragmatically, it is running a music magazine is a huge money sink. I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got your pitchforks and you've got, you know, a few other sites, but unless it's something that you're doing as a hobby, um certainly it's not it's not sustainable at all. I mean, you yeah. know, perhaps that's one of the, the very real parallels between music writing and music making. They yeah, I I I mean, they obviously have a symbiotic relationship and I do I think of even like um in Canada we have a few university publications that uh are funded by the university and it's a chance for young writers to write things and it's a chance for young musicians to hear th- some feedback you know in a textual sense feedback that gets broadcast out I think it's like a super important part of my own development. I mean, speaking of of sort of misremembered and unfully realized memories, when Kip emailed me and told me that this album was coming out and asked if I wanted to talk to you, my immediate response was the night I decided to move into my college house, uh, Frog Eyes was playing that show in Santa Cruz at this little... This little house behind Marie Callender is on uh, off of uh, Ocean Street in Santa Cruz. No, was it called the Cube House? It wasn't the Cube. It was, okay. No, I did go to oh, the Cube Lot. Something. Okay, we called it the Close to Too Much Fun House because there was a party store right around the corner called Too Much Fun. But I just have this like, <laughs> yeah, one of those associations of just like, yeah. Every time I think of you, I will think of the fact that like I went to a, a show at this house and decided that night that I was going to move in there. Right on. I have, I think we played Santa Cruz twice. Well, maybe three times. Cause I think there's a crepe house. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, yeah, I think actually, that might've been a little after yeah, my time, but I do, yeah. know, I do know the crepe house. So that, yeah. you would have been sort of moving up in the world at that point when you're exactly, you know, from house shows exactly. to crepe house. Totally. Yeah. That's probably the, the Zenith of our fame. <laughs> the measurable zenith is the crepe house i liked all those shows i feel sympathetic towards uh santa cruz because it reminded me a lot of my hometown which was victoria mm. and i feel like you know it's close enough to this uh major city but it's also kind of geographically isolated and i felt like oh you you all make your own fun here don't you to be fair and i assume this is probably similar or at least certainly similar to where you are now i mean it's the there's a lot of fun to be had between the ocean and the redwood forest. Yeah, totally. I I mean that too. Yeah, that you have this uh, access to a very specific kind of ambience. So this period that we're talking about now, I guess, would have been pretty early on into the band's formation, or at least the band coming down and playing the states. Yeah. Do you feel like you can kind of measure out that? As you said, the zenith that you hit, I know, like some somewhat tongue in cheek, but um, of really hitting sort of. It's probably for me, it's just a, it's I guess it's a somewhat of a plateau, just the idea that you could as a Canadian band go and play uh, American shows. The era that you would have seen us would have had us providing probably a kind of a uh, recording letter to get over the border because we wouldn't have been able to have afford visas. I think at the time when we're actually able to afford visas and the occasional hotel, that would have been felt like, oh yeah, okay, so this is real now. You know, we're like a real band. We have a visa and we can afford the occasional hotel. Uh, And that's probably, and come, you know, I mean, I guess come home, 
not just break even, but actually come home with some money. Uh, I mean, it all feels like a dream, you know, uh, and I'm glad to have dreamed it very much. It's really hard to imagine going back to that. Uh, for one, you know, it's just so shockingly expensive to do anything. And the idea of just slogging it out, you know, uh, a continental run. I think the bands that are still doing that are doing that in a tour bus. And I think that would leave us homeless. <laughs> when you say do that, you mean specifically touring the States? Yeah, I guess, to, you know, I still am. Uh, I come from an era where your success is really defined by how much America embraces you. I think that's sewn into my my musical DNA that that it didn't matter what you did in Canada. And in fact, we're like probably a good example of a band that has always had more uh, of people were more interested in us and more supportive in the States than in Canada. Uh, you know, we're not a band that the our national broadcaster, we don't we don't exist to them, uh, you know, uh, and so. It's funny because other acts that will be like even remotely looked at by an American institution, the local institutions here get in a, a tizzy. Or and you've got CanCon up there, which, you know, yeah. does is something that certainly like we don't have here. I mean, there is there is a sense. Yeah. And, and maybe Frog Eyes w wasn't able to take advantage of it as much. I, I, I suspect probably Swan Lake maybe was because, you know, you've got the the added force of Dan in the band. But yeah. Yeah, Canada generally does a better job of elevating the arts than we tend to do down here. No, <laughs> <laughs> you can I disagree with me. I can't. I can't fucking get behind that statement, except to say then your bar must be abysmally low. Oh, hundred uh, percent. Yeah, I mean, and it is. It, it is. Yeah, I'm, and and you know, and maybe it's something that like it's sort of hard to conceptualize. But yeah, there's just there. And, completely non-existent here yeah that even even something like even just having like grants for, for yeah. artists or is yeah. is, 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 a, is a much better spot than we're at yeah but grants are their own pitfall if you it depends on what how you you're the filter you want to apply to your own work and so when i talk about my work i really think about my body of work and i think that my body of work is better having not got very many grants because I think grants you're like oh my gosh I got a grant what did I do right what aesthetically did I do right and you might move yourself into a position where you rely on grants but isn't there a sense where you do that with any level of success that you feel like hey what do I have to do to keep you know to you know that keep keep pressing the uh the value button yeah that's very true and that how careerists approach their career i think yeah uh so um i but i think if you're outside of the grant system you think of it as like oh my gosh all i have to do is just you know wave my hand and a, and some amazon drone comes by <laughs> and drops ten thousand dollars down the chimney it's very much not the case not the case at all there's a yeah there's a specific way of being a specific positioning that really you have to do the dance and i don't know how well doing the dance feels if you have to do it for too long but that's for me you know i'm not judging anyone i'm just saying that's how i've always felt for me i've gotten a grant once or twice i've never gotten a grant to make a record though I've never gotten any grants. They we don't. They, they just there aren't really grants down here as in yeah. the way they are up there. Yeah, and even the grant, even when if you do get a grant to kind of make a record, I you know I don't know if it's like your MacArthur grant where it's just like go off and do something. Yeah, but you know I think like ten people win that a year. I know, I know. Yeah, exactly. I know it's true. It's maybe not. It's not fair to even even evoke. Except for the fact that it's like the best thing. It's a massive amount of money. Yeah, and it's I'm I don't know if they that if there's a criticism of that model. Uh, there's a criticism of the Canadian model, which like 
bestows big, big lumps of money on a select few. And I think that there's a general conversation about maybe we could like slice that up and give, you know, medium amounts to uh, a whole bunch of people. I don't know. It's it's kind of outside of what I my day to day, to be honest. I think that's part of it. And, and I kind of respect the more, I guess, socialist take to, to, you know, I guess what is already a level of socialism there. But one of the issues I would say that I would have with like the MacArthur grants in particular, probably most grants is when people are awarded them, they mostly seem to be ver- really well established. You know, they're they're given to people right. who like have already created a body of work. And yeah, like, yeah. Oh, now you can have an extra year to like make more. But it's yeah. it's not about discovery, and it's not about helping people who really are at a level where they need it in the same yeah. way. We talk about that in education. Even there's something in education called the Matthew effect, which is when uh, it's a verse from Matthew. It's something like the rich, the rich get the riches, you know, the, and the the poor could use some of those riches. But for some reason, the riches go to the rich still. Uh, and um, yeah, for sure. What was that period of your life when the, the, the sort of few brief fleeting moments when you did treat it like a job? How, how was it different than the way you normally interact with music? Uh, I think I just was really um, just always scheming like, whoa, you know, rent is like you pay rent and you have 15 minutes to sit there and have a drink of water. And then you think, oh, my gosh, it's coming again in 30 days. (laughs) Yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, and I that was the kind of the wonderful, uh, seductive years that actually I say seductive because I think a lot of people looked at the money that they might have made in those years and thought, this is a decent wage, which for some of my friends, it totally was. And I feel like I say seductive, because I think that actually was the blip. That was the anomaly in that you have the coinciding of the touch and go model, uh, which even these labels that purportedly still give the touch and go model i think that there's some sneaky shit going on uh you know ways of slicing that down that um no one was slicing it down then because it was very important to be seen there was enough i don't know there was enough there was enough options for a young hot band To really be like, well, I could go here. This is a great offer. This is a great offer. This is a great offer. It was nothing but great offers. And, uh, and so, uh, and that coincided with like, you know, the compact disc and, and, um, really actually quite significant record profits. Sorry, my little alarm for whatever reason. Uh, yeah. So, uh, those, you know, and so, unfortunately, Sometimes, I mean, I even one of the people that ran a like a record label, I was talking to this to him and he was like, you know, there's no God given reason that musicians should make money off of their music. That's actually if you look at the history of music, that that's kind of an anomalous situation. It's, it's, not, it's a little cynical no. Well, coming from the guy that runs your record label. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. So I'm like, okay, that's fair. But if we're not making money, then how, who the fuck is, you know, because there's a whole bunch of money coming in. Why do you deserve it more than I yeah. deserve it? But now I think only the al- only the masters of the algorithms, you know, the record labels aren't making money. The record stores aren't making money. The publicists aren't making money. Your, your booking agent, I don't know, might be making some money, but uh, you know, and then this idea of like, Oh, a band should just go out and make their money off the, on, off the road. Like, no, 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 no. That's, that's complete hogwash. That, that's insane it is so shockingly expensive to be to spend a minute away (laughs) from your home you know yeah i hear there are ways in which it's especially difficult to tour canada just because it's 
Like, yeah. It's it's so far from place to place. Yeah. And I think when COVID hit where I live, Vancouver, uh, there was a moment when the airport shut down and we realized maybe as a city, okay, to the east, there's this gigantic lump of rock called the Rocky Mountains. You know, this is almost impassable for for a good portion of the year. And then to the west is the ocean, uh, to the north is the north, and then to the south is the United States. And even that, even if there was no border, or if the border, if this, if the United States government was like, welcome, we see that you are going to come and play shows, which is actually good for our economy, please come in for free, uh, even if that happen you're still kind of geographically ex- isolated with the exception of seattle and portland but when the airport shut down it was like yeah we're so alone here uh and it just kind of was like it was an interesting moment because then you you're like oh i guess i either have to um spend that exorbitant amount of money for visas so that i can go to seattle and portland or to san francisco and los angeles or to fly to new york The visa thing alone is like thousands and thousands of dollars on top of the thousands and thousands of dollars of expenses that you're going to incur. So I just kind of pretend that (laughs) this is the beauty of a daily practice. This sounds very sad, doesn't it? And defeating. But for me, I'm just like, whatever. All I have to do is keep playing and keep writing songs. That's my job, you know? Uh, if I need to play live, I can play some venues around here and, uh, and then lo and behold, before I can even lament the, the lack of a headlining tour or a crepe house, <laughs> I'm going to have another couple songs, uh, anyways. Right. So, uh, and that's, that's my coping, coping mechanism because that's the last frog eyes tour was relatively successful. I think we had, uh, sold out venues uh, we still came home, you know, thousands of dollars uh, in the hole, uh, as I remember. When I think about my friends who might have been seduced from the, that those that zenith where the money really was coming in, I'm like, damn, like, that's a tough place to be in. If your resume is like 2004 to 2021 <laughs> showed up at soundcheck <laughs> man that's a fucking tough place to be in uh, i'm grateful though for the uh kind of intensity and care of their network my friends who are professional musicians seem to have a really devoted level of 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 support from their fans so they're able to make websites and people still consume their music and purchase it yeah at that level it has to be your job and that it has to be something that you are continually focused on between the process of making music and being on tour that it is a a daily thing of you know keeping in touch with people and keeping in touch with people yeah but like Let's just step back. Remember, we were talking about like, you know, in, in, in the interview, if your boss asks you, what is the purpose of your job? You wouldn't say, oh, it's to please you. Uh, if someone was to say, if there was a musician interview that you took before you entered the profession of musician, you wouldn't say, oh, my job is to stay in touch with people. Or my job is to constantly be representing the true essence of me. I mean, sure, if that's like what you do well, that's cool. But this whole idea of like, you know, to be a musician in this age is very easy. You just like have seven social media accounts where you're constantly, uh, you know, sharing and giving glimpses of your true authentic self. Jesus Christ, like that works for one kind of fucking person but you know it really it really immediately disqualifies a whole bunch of very interesting people who are very uncomfortable with that approach so i'm not like saying that the person who does that skillfully is a sociopath 
I wasn't implying that you were, but now that you say it, now, now I'm thinking it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm really not. Some people are just naturally like really good at that, you know. And so, but I I am lamenting that there's an economic model that only kind of suits that one person. Is it a level of discomfort in sort of engaging with those other aspects, the non music making aspects of making music, or are you just kind of disinterested in it? I find it pretty boring and I'm really quite um, nervous about how uh, boring everyone else might feel about a picture of my dog or whatever, you know, my backyard or the book I'm reading or, you know, it's just that there's so many me's out there. There's so many carries. There's so many people. Let's just say, let's pretend or not pretend. Let's, let's just presume that I make interesting things. There are so many people that make interesting things out there and to constantly be polluting people's attention with the me, me, me-ness of me seems just like. But isn't the, isn't there a level of presumption that people are going to want to listen to the music you make? Yeah, sure. So wait. So that's at that time in these little brief moments, I think I'm in one right now. In the, the couple weeks around the release of a record, I might be like, me, 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 <laughs> you know, but even I'm still like, yeah, I'm tortured about what to retweet versus what to like, you know, because I don't want to be rude. And in fact, the person, anyone who writes anything about something that I do really am very grateful for, but the but to retweet something is also to publish something and i don't care about oh i wouldn't want to publish something that's not wildly popular it's more like i just did this an hour ago with this other thing and i didn't know this was coming so i feel like i'm done for at least a couple days you know it's just it's just that feeling of like awkwardness about being aware of uh there there's a and this I'm not like being super um self conscious about this following musicians on Twitter is like a its own meme it is strange that we're at a point where you would assume that anyone would assume that somebody wants to interact with frog eyes the way they do kylie jenner you know what i mean of like (laughs) strange music in a lot of ways there has traditionally been a power in having an air of mystery around it sure i mean it's not strange music to me right it's pretty it's my music so it's not strange at all for me the i the something that i find really like if you said what makes you happy one thing that would make me happy is the fact that like people who like frog eyes maybe 15 years ago actually still like us and the weird thing about that is those people might be 45 years old or 35 years old or way beyond the demographic that that typically you're supposed to be shooting for or whatever. And I so I think being careful and thoughtful about how much attention to take from people and making it only about the music is that's my filter. My filter is to think about the body of work. And so I don't even think about records being judged individually. I think about how they detract or <laughs> or raise up the body of work i for, and it it's quite nice to think like that too because if you make a record that you know people are like yeah you're like well okay that's fair i mean i've made fucking 19 of them <laughs> do you feel like you have struggled to keep people on board for the duration of the bands i mean do, do people tend to kind of go in and out I don't really know, but I do like get emails from the same people. So, but I, I I don't really know. I mean, of course, I mean, there must be music that you liked three years ago. Sure. Five years ago, 10 years ago. Right. So, uh, for some people we would be very hilariously emblematic of a certain era of music, 2004 to 2000. A certain era of music and also a certain period in their life. 
Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then for other people, it would be like, oh, actually, well, I like continue to like that band or I like that band. I disregarded a certain period. And then there was I heard a song of theirs on the radio or whatever. And I thought, oh, OK, that's kind of cool. Or, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's there's so many ways that someone can approach something. You had alluded to the last tour and like at the time it was last with a capital L. Yeah. You know, that, that right. it really did feel like the end of something and the, the end of, you know, this long running bands. But that that must have afforded yourself and probably afforded a lot of your fans an opportunity to those people who did go away to come back into the fold. Because when you realize this thing that you love and maybe mm-hmm. haven't paid a lot of attention to recently is going away, yeah. suddenly you re-embrace it. Yeah. Uh, even if it was... It wasn't intended to be a feint or a fake. It could have been, you could think of it as a kind of a ritualistic thing that could happen in any band's career, which is just to say, would you come out and love me? <laughs> is that you know? what it was? It was, I, I not consciously, but it was, uh, you know, it was something for fucking sure, you know, when people were like, oh, I traveled from Alaska or I was just like, I couldn't believe it, you know? Uh, and so to if I'm going to assess my life's work in terms of the body of work, to me, that, may, that means like I've been somewhat successful, you know? Uh, but I still feel like there's so much to learn, you know? I'm sure you don't necessarily want to relitigate this, but for a band that, you know, at least like when it comes to members has been fairly nebulous, but has always been defined by by you being in the bands, by by your songs. Why did it feel right at the time to end that project or to kill that name? The thinking then really was that it didn't, it would just seem inappropriate. Like there was a mood in, in, in the time and, I think looking back, I very much forgive myself for being uh, falling into this mood, which was almost like burn the old world <laughs> that that kind. And I felt like we had stretched back long enough that where was that coming from? I think it was coming from profound realization that like we're in this situation that our way of being has to we have to somehow sever uh our way ways of being i think that's actually wrong it sounds super dramatic when you describe it like that yeah i get i just get dramatic though sometimes too i I think i'm i'm bit manic sometimes you know i just get i get so overwhelmed by the darkness of of the times and i just feel like oh my god i have to have some kind of a response to it, some kind of artistic response or some, I have to pause it myself. These are probably my stupidest moments, but, uh, but I also give myself a full pass because it's the stupidest time and it's the hardest time. But there are ways in which like in very real ways that things have only gotten harder and more difficult and more dire. And certainly in the past two years, you know, us living through this like once in a lifetime situation is there is there a way in which you almost like come out the other side and want to reconnect with that thing it totally is i mean at the end we hadn't planned we weren't like let's go back to frog eyes okay i'm gonna write some songs with a frog eyes tinge to it it was more like the desire for a recentering uh the desire I guess the latent desire for Melanie and I to just re-engage with the form that suits us best, I think. And so, and maybe that's part, you know, when people talk about like COVID making you really reassess or reach, reach for creature comforts, or maybe it, it, maybe it was comforting to, to say, why don't we just play music the way we played music for you know quite a long time and how we started and and i do think that our the particular eccentricities of our playing really constitute the the heart of frog eyes in terms of the body of work and then whoever the two of us are playing with 
then constitutes the eccentricity or characteristic of the particular record. So I just I think, you know, now that we're talking about it, yeah, I probably was just wanting some kind of s- comfort and stability after everything had, you know, you can't even play Something a gig familiar. anymore. Yeah, yeah. But really, honestly, we came to the end of the record and we laughed and we're like, this is just a Frog Eyes record. Before that, that would I would have been like, it's just a Frog Eyes record. This time, we were like patting each other on the back. And I think so, if you think of burying the band in a sense of like going into the underworld and having some time with yourself and going through maybe a, a kind of a crisis of identity or a crisis of multiple crises, I guess, and then coming out and being like, you know what, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of where I that, I, that has sustained, you know, I'm actually, even the, 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 na- the term frog eyes, it used to fill me with a sense of dread and shame. And now I'm like, yeah, frog eyes, you know, that's, that's, that's just like a, another thing that I've done. Why, uh, dread and shame are strong words. I mean, and and it must be difficult to feel those feelings about this thing you're so closely identified with. What was the what were the roots of those feelings? I think maybe part of it was just feeling like, well, I've always thought like, well, would I even like this if I was in the crowd? And I think. I can answer now. Yeah, I think it would be really cool. I'm. We're gonna play a concert tomorrow night, and I was last time we jammed, which was last night or two nights ago. I just was like, I would really love this. I would be massively sucked in at this kind of swirling chaos of it, and also the the compositions and the energies seem really particular. Yeah. So, but prior to that, yeah, it just seemed like. Well, I don't know. People can say mean things to you and people can say 20 n- nice things to you and they say one mean thing to you. And all, of course, all you hear is the one mean thing. Uh, I think I'm just have been personally just hardwired to, you know, be a little brutal to myself, too. I didn't know about I may, you know, it's possible that actually what I've learned in teaching, like, like, uh, Because, you know, when kids come in and they're like, I hate my brain. It's stupid. I'm so stupid. I'm like, well, what I've learned is that your brain just hears that voice and it doesn't differentiate that it's coming from inside of you. All it hears when you say horrible, cruel stuff to yourself. The brain is doesn't know that you're saying it. The brain is just curious. Well, if anything, it it can amplify when it's. (laughs) It, it it echoes around and yeah. the voice is louder coming inside it, your own exactly. head. Exactly. And I used to think that that part of the artistic process was just being scathing to yourself, you know? Uh, and I, I, I don't really think that anymore. You had an opportunity to, to reset your brain and, and you had this almost this palate cleanser where you're able to hear your own music with fresh ears. Yeah. But I do think it's also now that, I mean, I'm just the, like, I hadn't prepared to talk about this, but this might be an epiphanous moment for for me that you're witnessing. The social emotional language and tools that we have access to now that I actually have kind of come to embrace in my life, especially from teaching and preaching it to kids, are so far advanced than what I had access to in the 90s, where, you know, if you if you talk to a therapist, like, You must have, you must have like, your family must have been beheaded or, you know, like (laughs) there's that stigma. And, and, and we've gone, we've gone sort of so far in the direction where it's like, people are like, now there's a stigma of not going to therapy. But I think on top of that, and and I'm just thinking about this a lot because I'm reading this, this bell hooks book about masculinity right now is I, I think that that is an added layer on top of that. There are a lot of things that as men are programmed in mm-hmm. us from an early age when it comes to not being connecting with your emotions and not discussing them openly. Oh, totally. And uh, like my the one particular characteristic of my scene or city is you have like I would go to a party and and I would be openly mocked by my oldest best friends. And I'd be like, 
<laughs> this is great, guys. <laughs> you know, like just just shredded. Uh, and of course, then I would also I would shred. Uh, and so it was just kind of really vicious. Uh, we, we, we call it like intellectual horseplay as a joke, you know, uh, but actually it was like quite, quite brutal, you know, uh, and you had to be able to take it. It sounds very masculine, doesn't it? Yeah. I talked to a musician recently whose band had broken up a long time ago and, and, and that was like, he really pointed to that in your early twenties, especially that sort of, um, that like competitive ribbing that we give to each other yeah, where, yeah. you know, it, where, where it seems nice and it seems friendly, but like yeah. it, it calcifies and it, and it, it adds up over time and it's, and it's impossible, even the jokey stuff, not to internalize it to a certain extent. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I guess just where I, that was the, that was my milieu is, uh, you better have that around you. Otherwise you'll be lost. You know, uh, you better have a, a, a jeering chorus of the harsh, super witty <laughs> brutalizers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know. I don't care. Cause it's not where I'm at now, you know? So, uh, where, and, and that's kind of who I am too. Where I'm at is where I'm at. Uh, yeah. And you see yourself continuing to play music forever in some formation well forever is a is a strange term but uh you know as long as you're able to as long certainly as, I'm, as long as you can lift a guitar yeah well i don't i mean no but at the end of each project i do kind of think do i want to keep doing this and i just kind of let my natural predilections my my the, the habit of practice kind of just take over but i do i, I always am like this is a moment that if I wasn't into this, I should stop. And I'm like, yeah, okay, well, but then I'll be sitting there and I'll be thinking about the sound of the guitar emanating from the amplifier or, you know, often I'll think about the physical thing. I'll think about the reverb pan or the, the power tubes, you know, pushing it out or the way, the reason that the tremolo sounds like that is the modulation of the power tubes. And at, sometimes I'm in the middle of a conversation with my family and I'll be like, okay, <laughs> hold that thought. I'm going to go downstairs and play the guitar. And that's funny. And I think this is perfect because I, I do think this brings us full circle in an interesting way is that, you know, you don't have that bus driver pull over moment of inspiration that I need to write a song, but it does manifest itself in a certain way. And it's, I need to play music. Yeah. It's desire. Yeah, it's desire, but it's not it's not uh, it's not hinged around a particular thing that comes before the actual act. Insofar as you can describe it, what is that impulse that you need to like run out of the room and get out of your system? Mm, it's I think it's love of sound, man. I think I just I fucking love it. You know, I really do. Uh, and yeah, maybe I love it just a little bit more than the person who made two records. <laughs> and I love it that much more than that person who wrote four records, you know? Yeah. Uh, and it might, it certainly is not talent. It's just, it might be fealty to the form. 